Okay. My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm the project director for the Oklahoma State University Library's oral history project entitled Women of the Oklahoma Legislature, Past and Present. With me today is Laura Boyd, Boyd and today is December the 20th, 2006, and Miss Boyd served in the, in the House from 1992 to 1998. Thank you for sharing your story with us today. Okay, let's get started. Tell me a little bit about your youth, your hometown, your siblings, your, your childhood. Uh, Tanya, I grew up in North Carolina. My father was the chaplain at North Carolina State University. My mother was a secretary for the North Carolina legislature for 35 years. And that is very important to me. And my father was very, very involved in the civil rights movement. He participated in the sit-ins and the early sit-ins in Walgreens. Um, Walgreens uh, drugstores. He uh, was the first person to encourage African American students at the, at the University of North Carolina, excuse me, North Carolina State University, North Carolina State. And uh, to this day, my father passed away two years ago, but to this day, students of his contact us uh, for Christmas or regularly and, and talk about the impact that he had on their lives. So um, I, I share that because I think that that has a whole lot to do with who I am, being very, very involved from the time that I was six in issues of fairness, equality, um, in confronting systems, confronting cultures, being accepting, being willing to take risks, um, and, and having it ingrained in me that it was my responsibility to make this world a little better place for everybody. And when did you come to Oklahoma? I came to Oklahoma in 1978. So I've been here now about 30 years and um, uh, spent first, I, I say it's not accurate, but I tell people I spent the first half of my life in North Carolina and the second half plus, well, I'm gonna spend here because uh, Oklahoma, I came to Norman and uh, Norman was, when I first came, almost 30 years ago, was very, very much like Raleigh, North Carolina. University town, small, very comfortable. I came as a single mom. And so it was like putting the other glove on with all the demands that a single mom has. I just felt like I uh, moved very much into my old town because I was familiar with the feelings. Okay. How and when did you decide to become involved in politics? That is also an interesting story, um, and I think, and I share it with you because it's important to me. I um, didn't. I was not interested in politics, and I was afraid of politics. I worked very, very hard to be a good mother, to be a good small business person. I have a PhD in psychology, and I owned and directed my own clinic. I worked very, very hard to be the very best professional possible, and the idea of politics just seemed overwhelming. I didn't know anything about it. What I knew I didn't like. It wasn't, didn't seem very nice. And I was, I was fearful of it. And I share that because I think a lot of really good, smart people today are still fear, fearful of it. And yet I know, having been elected politician, how very, very important it is to vote each and every time. I received a phone call on a particular day, I guess it must have been a Monday, saying from my predecessor, in my house district saying, would I run for the House of Representatives? And I said, I don't know anything about taxes. I don't know anything about roads and bridges. I don't even vote regularly. And she said to me, you can do this. You're bright, you like people, you learn quickly, you can do this. And so I said, well, let me think it over, talk to my husband, think it over overnight, and we'll make a decision. And she said, you have an hour and a half until filing mm -hmm. closes. So my husband and I went back and forth very, very quickly, decided our life was good, life was busy, but I was making good income. I was home every evening. And uh, he said, well, let's just let this pass. And at that point, I said to him, no, I, this is a door that's been presented. I never looked for it. I think it's something I'm supposed to do. And he said, go for it. So I did. And that's how I got in politics. So your first opponent was a, a, a man or a woman? A My man? first opponent was a woman, actually. Mm -hmm. It was an open seat, 
I'm a Democrat, and the Republicans put forward a woman who actually had run for the same seat at least one time prior, maybe two, but at least one time prior. So she had actually much more political and campaign experience than I had. Mm -hmm. Or constituents rural or mixed or, or? They are suburban. In Norman, my district is suburban families, educated because of the university, mm -hmm. suburban. Who were some of the more important people, both in Oklahoma and nationally, that inspired you to go into politics? Well, Besides looking back, my father and my mother, um, it seems kind of strange, but with my mother having been a secretary at North Carolina legislature for 35 years, both of them actually had um, laid a lot of the groundwork unconsciously that I wasn't aware of. My husband gets a lot of credit for it too. My husband and his family had been very, very involved in democratic politics. Um, my husband had run for district attorney in Cleveland County prior to my ever meeting him. So he, he had a little bit of that interest. His brother had been very involved in democratic politics. He was in David Hall's administration, governor of Oklahoma. He had been very, he had, uh, he ran John Glenn's campaign in Kentucky and in Florida when he ran for president at one point in time. All of this prior to my marrying into the family. But, um, but again, my husband, uh, when when he would give me, when he gave me his support, it has been there continually, and he he knows about politics. His brother especially uh, was very important to me. I think those I I, um, I think of the times of John F. Kennedy was so important as a young child. Uh, my father took us to Washington D.C. the weekend that Kennedy um, Kennedy's burial happened. And uh, remember how cold and rainy it was and how important that was to me in terms of my philosophies more than, again, my desire to be in politics. Anyone, any one person stand out as a mentor? In, as a woman, uh, Barbara Jordan. Barbara Jordan does. African-American congresswoman from Texas uh, in a wheelchair, very outspoken, took on huge challenges. Another woman whom I admire so very, very much is Hannah Atkins of Oklahoma. And once you were in office, did anyone kind of take you as their protege? Or? There were a number of young women that I have um, mentored over the years. I started a program, I was the first one to start a program at the Capitol of, of Internships. And I had interns for a semester from OU, from UCO, and I believe I had one from Stillwater. And they would come for the semester, and they generally had to give the school required 15 hours a week. And of those women that I mentored, they're still very, very much a part of my family. Uh, mm -hmm. One of them is now 35. She's married. I was her matron of honor at her wedding. Another one is single, has always been single, and we are still very, very close. In fact, um, last year I picked up another young woman at New Leadership at the University of Oklahoma, which takes uh, graduate and undergraduate women, and she's going to meet me after this interview for lunch, and we've been really working on her career. Um, I'm very proud of her. She's uh, another young woman is in Washington, D.C. We got her through her master's degree, and she's part of the family. So I always pick women, and uh, yet they, they have stayed part of the family. So I consider myself as having five or six grown-up daughters as well as my three natural. That's very neat. Okay, tell me a little bit about your campaign. Who sponsored it? Who were your main supporters? Should we talk about the governor's race, mostly since I'm the only woman in Oklahoma to ever run for governor on a national on the general election ticket? You can do a little bit of both if you want. Okay. That's fine. Whichever. Um, the I had much support from my Norman constituency when I was in the House. My most difficult race was my first race, and I won that with 54 percent. And then each year it went up. And so I try to work very, very hard to stay in contact with my Norman um, electorate. And uh, we, we had quite a bit of support. Once you're in, you, in the House of Representatives, you get support from the PACs and the general uh, groups that, that are going to be lobbying. And so it's really not difficult to maintain as an incumbent once you're in. For the governor's race, it was quite difficult. Here I was, a woman. Um, I did not have much support. 
from the Democratic ranks, which were run by men. I didn't have any opposition. I just didn't have support. And I had so many people in high positions across the state, whether they were in Democratic politics or just strong Democrats with money backing and had been players in, in uh, campaigns in the past, who said to me in that first year afterwards, if we'd known you were going to do so well, we would have gotten out there more. And of course that irked me. And I used to think, are you trying to make me feel better? Because you certainly don't. I think you're saying that to make you feel better for not having come out to stand up for a woman. So there was not the support that should have been there from men, uh, from women, from the party. One of the things I think is very important that I have said over and over again since that race is because we did do very, very well and we were outspent about 10 to 1 by an incumbent Republican, is that we taught Frank Keating that you cannot win a campaign if you don't have a message that truly resonates with the people. Frank Keating taught me that you cannot win a campaign if you don't have enough money. Yeah. Hard, lesson. Hard lessons. Hard lessons. Okay, running for office takes much time and effort. What were some of your biggest challenges in running for office? The biggest challenge was money. money. The biggest challenge for governor was money. We ran a very grassroots, well, we also were running against an incumbent who had name recognition. And because he was a sitting governor, he could command the press at any time. Those were very difficult. I do not recommend that women run against incumbents. I think it's still, in 2006, very, very difficult. Um, however, we ran a grassroots campaign where we put 100,000 miles on my car and were well received in every city, town, and hamlet in Oklahoma. And uh, my family supported my being gone. If I were home, I would leave at 6 a.m. in the morning, I'd be back at dark. Many times we spent the night on the road, and we always stayed in the home of someone in whatever county we were in. People I did not know. I met so many people, but I had a wonderful field team who really believed in me, and they were out there setting up these homes where I could just drive in at any time of the day or night. That also taught me a whole lot about Oklahomans all over the state. That's very neat, too. Okay, and describe your political philosophy. Do you have one? Yes, I do. Um, I believe that our work, particularly as women leaders, is not done until every child has someone who cares about him or her for the duration of their childhood, until they have a roof over their head, adequate food, and health care, until women are paid on the same salary scale for work done that men are until our seniors can live out their days, again, with a roof over their head, access to food, health care, and someone who cares about them. And it is incumbent upon us to lead in those directions and to make those issues of fairness and health and well-being for all generations our goals, because if we don't do it, no one else will. Uh, when you took your office, what were some of your goals that you had in mind going into the office? My goals uh, from when I first went into the House and when I was running for governor uh, stayed very much the same. A lot of the philosophy I just said, uh, working, our mantra running for governor was every child's right to enter school healthy and ready to learn. Well, lo and behold, that is not uh, new news anymore. We've heard a lot about that. We did immediately in Oklahoma in Governor Keating's second term, but even nationally we're hearing that now. And so when I came into office, my, my concerns were around health care and were around education. And I talked about early childhood education, but I was also blessed to chair higher education when I was in the legislature. And that was a joy to work with, at that point in time, the 25 colleges and universities across Oklahoma as their leader was um, so enriching for me. These presidents were organized, they were energetic, they were all men except one, 
and they could not have been behind me more mm. to succeed as chair of higher education. That's great. Can you describe a typical day? Oh, a week? <laughs> it's hard. Yeah, it's it's hard to say. Um, I know About that six, you said. when I would drive up from Norman every morning, I had a little. A uh, couple little prayers that I would say about the day uh, in terms of um, thy will be done. And I also had another little one that that was I, I ride on the wings of angels and eagles. And that comes really from Native American influence in this state as well as just my belief that I'm a vessel for better and bigger things than I can imagine. So I have my mindset. Uh, the day was very, very busy meeting with people. I had wonderful legislative assistants, and if it were not for those legislative assistants, could not have done nearly the things that I was able to do because they took care of constituents when I couldn't be there. Uh, it's a very, very busy and demanding day. You have, to, you, you have no time to talk to your colleagues except on the floor of the chamber, and I think we get criticized a lot for the chaos and the noise. Well, that is well deserved, probably a third of it. But the other two thirds, that's the only time you get to see your colleagues. Unless, you, unless you're one of the ones who hangs around to go out to bars and dinners at night. And I didn't do much of that. I should have probably done more of that because that was part of the culture. But um, the days are very, very busy and they're very, very long. Uh, do you, can you think of any obstacles in particular that you faced during like, your first term? Anything in particular come to mind? The biggest obstacle is being a woman. Mm -hmm. There is also an obstacle of being a freshman, and they tell you, or used to, that as a freshman you ought to sit down and shut up for a year. <laughs> and I, I pass that information on and that advice on in a little nicer way because I didn't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had the obstacle of being a woman, but I also had the obstacle of being a very energetic, uh, very outspoken freshman. In fact, uh, they give an award at the end of the year, every year, called Mouth of the House. <laughs> and I am honored to have received that at the end of my first year uh, because it basically reflects someone who would not sit down and be quiet, whether that's good or bad. And for me, in many ways, it was. I mean, there were times I should have been quiet. There are other times where I'm glad I wasn't quiet. But um, I think at the end of my freshman year, I was kind of perceived, this is the way I put it, as everybody's bratty little 10-year-old sister. I was always there asking questions. Now, it would, I support that I needed to learn and I wanted to, wanted to learn. Um, but what I learned to do after my first year was how to do that a little more gracefully. Mm. And it did pay off very, very well in, in terms of just being able to work more successfully as a budding legislator as well as a woman. When I was there, there were only six women. And so we were not, um, they didn't know how to deal with us. The boys system didn't know how to deal with us and we did not know very well how to integrate into the boys system. How many of those six were freshmen as well? I was the only freshman woman. I was the only freshman woman, so that, that uh, perhaps made my learning curve even a little more tough. Do you still stay in touch with those? Yes, same I do. Well, with some of them I do. Um, some of them, uh, again, out of six, uh, some of us were so far apart philosophically mm -hmm. that we never created a relationship. Um, four of three of the others, yes, I do stay in touch with. Them. That's great. Do you have a particular leadership style? Were you chair of any committees? Yes, I chaired higher education. I chaired a committee called um, Children and Family Services. Okay. Um, and I, I'm not sure. I'm more aware of my leadership style now than I was then. Um, I think I listened to everyone. I wanted to make sure people feel involved and, and included. Uh, I also was, felt very directed about where we needed to go. And um, some of the risks I took were standing up as leader of committees, especially, for example, the Higher Education Committee. That endeared me to the people I represented. 
it uh, did not endear me to my colleagues from time to time. On those committees, were there other women or were you the lone woman? I was pretty much the lone woman. Again, there were not many women. On the um, Higher Education Committee, we did have one other woman president back then. Uh, but it was pretty much lone territory. Were you free to define your own political behavior or did you feel compelled to operate within gendered norms and boundaries? Well, that's very good. Um, I felt I was more successful when I conformed to gender norms and boundaries. I watched my predecessor have to do that too because I tried to pass some legislation or I was involved professionally in um, legislation for marriage and family therapists back in the 80s. And I remember watching her from the glass room um, having to kind of flirt with the boys on the floor. I drove down Lincoln Boulevard one day saying to myself, I will never do that job in my feminist self. I will never do that. I will not, I would not compromise to have to get along in that environment. Um, I ate those words. Um, again, bratty little sister didn't work. And the second, uh, my second year, which is still my freshman term, um, I conformed to the culture more. Um, I did a little more flirting. I let them flirt. It was just flirting. And uh, once I, I was very uncomfortable about that because I didn't know whether it was flirting or not at first from the men. And as I, as I began to just take it as jokes or see it as jokes, it was real clear that there were jokes. Um, I, um, I was able to do much more, I was able to be a much more effective legislator by conforming to their culture, I'm sorry to say. But I think until there is a more, um, there is a mass of women, a, a larger mass, more meaningful mass, cadre of women who can change that culture, then your choice is to get along to go along, or go along and get along, or make some changes as you get along. And I think that's what I did, and I think that's what I saw three or four of my colleagues have to do to make a difference and to represent their constituencies. And it's been oh, six or seven years since you were in the House. Can you tell if it's been any improvement since then? Just Well, I think it has improved since I've been there. Number one, there are about, uh, I think there are 22 women total in the, ha in the House and Senate right now, I believe. Right. So we have almost four times the number of women as when I was there. We have enough women for a women's caucus. And, bec and they have even recognized that they have a significant mass so that they have talked about having a caucus between the Senate and the House of Women. I think it has changed. I'm still up there frequently. I know the women. I don't see the, between the six of us who are there, there's not the, part of, there's not the huge political split that divides that tiny group even more significantly. And, um, and, and I support more and more women. We've had more women run for office since I was there. We get a few more in. We still need many more to both run and to be elected. Uh, while you were running or once you were elected, did you feel any obligation or did others place an obligation on you to support women's issues in particular? Yes. Um, well, I don't know whether they did it to me or not, or whether I did it uh, to support women's issues. Again, I come from a very, in, in Norman, when I, when I was in Norman, it, the registration of Democrat-Republican was very, very close. They were not interested in my party status. They were an educated, informed, progressive, vocal, they're only 25 miles down the road, so they were here at the Capitol all the time. They were interested in representation around issues that mattered to them, progressive issues for families, for education, uh, for women. So um, my naive taste said when I came to the Capitol that everybody thinks like Norman. Wrong. No one thought like Norman. And so I learned that very quickly. But in my district, there was not the pressure to represent women. But when I came up, that was very important to me. 
And um, I've often said, I, I passed the Ryan Luke Law in 1996. I had tried for at least four to five years prior to that to pass the same legislation that benefited women, children, families, domestic violence, and it failed every single time. And we would debate for three days whether we should change the length of quail season. We would debate for three days whether your dog could ride free in the pickup truck, much less your child not being restrained in the bed of the pickup truck. Kids' bills were killed immediately. Nobody cared about what we call kids' bills until little Ryan Luke died at the hands of his caretakers in 1996. And that window opened and we ran with it. We put everything in the Ryan Luke law, including the kitchen sink. And we're successful. So was the pressure from out there on me? I really can't say that it probably was because my district so supported me. But indeed, um, I carried from the day one the traditional women's issues. Uh, describe any expectations from colleagues and the public may, that may have differed for women and men elected officials that you experienced or observed? Could you tell if there was a difference between how men and women were expected to perform or? Yes. Um, I can't, I, one of the first things that comes to my mind, of course, is dress and attire. Mm -hmm. And that was prevalent not only at the House, but that was prevalent when I ran for governor because the news articles would talk about what I had on um, as well as what I was saying. And they did not do that for male candidates or incumbents. And so I noticed in terms of attire. I also noticed some of the things that we've heard that um, if I were strong, certainly if I were irritated, then I would be described in less flattering terms. Um, I would not be described as strong, committed, um, in, intelligent, uh, decisive. I would be described more as shrill or more terms that dealt more with emotion. Those were clearly biased uh, statements, I believe, and they were they came from people's um, uh, lack of familiarity. I also approached, we had a race for Speaker of the House early in my career, and I um, was always very forthright, outspoken, probably also naive. But I said to one of the candidates, who asked for my support, that I was going to support the other candidate, that I truly believe the other candidate would be more open to women's leadership and treating women equally. And of course, my candidate got eight votes, and the other candidate walked away with like 93 votes, which certainly did not put me in very good stead with the incoming speaker for the next couple of years. Uh, so I think that there, in trying to make a change, and, and I did not, in, in my thinking, I did not mind the other individual becoming speaker. I wanted to support him and would support him as speaker. But I didn't anticipate a grudge being held because I had not been there for him. And I do think there were, there's prejudice in the legislature to this day from individuals who think think that they are not biased against women, and they truly are. The women see that and they know it. It's very small and very subtle, but it is there. And yet, I, I do want to say that those individuals, the reason I would not give you any names, is they have no idea that they're being prejudiced or from against women. But that still exists. And I think you can see a different break with those, who are, those males who are 45 and older, mm -hmm. and those who are younger, who are less who have that? Who or who don't have that um, instilled in them to the same degree today? That's interesting. Age break there. Mm -hmm. uh, any advice you want to give women con who are considering elected office? I want them to run. I want them to take that risk. Number one, you must have your family behind you. You cannot do this job if you don't have your family supporting you. So you need to check that out. Uh, they should talk to other women who have been there early and get their advice. They must be willing to ask for money. They must be 
confident and capable of raising money. And other women can help mentor them and make this much easier for them. But we need more women. I, I want to recommend that they take that leadership, that they have that desire, that passion. Women run because they have a philosophy, a goal, something they want to accomplish. Men tend to run primarily still for the power, the recognition, and the goals. Women run for the goals, and they need to become more comfortable about dealing with power. But that's one of the things we can help them with. You've mentioned support networks several times. Can you describe a little bit more about that? What it was like before you ran for office, and then Darren, and then had it changed after? I think my support network is even stronger today because the people, I, I still have so many of those relationships, whether they were elected people or friends from Shakota, from Tahlequah, from El Reno, who were just involved in my campaign, whom I would put on my, my short list of women friends that I go to when difficult things happen. Um, four and a half years ago, my husband was diagnosed with stage four throat cancer, and those women have been there for me through anything. And so my support network is in some ways is broader than it was. Um, because we were time tested now with each other through many things. Mm -hmm. When I was in office, my support network almost didn't exist um, because there were, again, very few women. And we were so busy that working to do the best we could that it was the, the support network was really our families. And uh, that was our support network during that time. During campaign, my campaign workers um, and our families, and um, and so that's something that women need to think about very carefully: is a few close, close colleagues because you need them. You need them. It sounds like you need time management skills as much as other things. Women are usually pretty good about that, um, except that we always overdo. It it is still true that a woman has to do one hundred and twenty five percent of what's expected of a man, and they still don't get recognition or credit for it. So I think women really are pretty good with time management skills. I think what women probably need is they need permission to somewhere put themselves on that list of priorities, whether it's a bath, whether it's that drive for 30 minutes where you turn off the cell phone. Whether, whatever it is, women need to put themselves somewhere in that priority list before they are so depleted that it costs them in ways that they cannot recover. So that you've, you've alluded to the social life of the legislature a little bit earlier. Can you tell, talk a little bit more about that? I was very lucky, actually. I, I'm was only in Norman, but for four years I did um, rent a room in a house with six guys. Mm -hmm. And I laughingly say the only way that my husband would have let me live in that part of Oakland City was to have six roommates. And the only way the proprietor would have rented to this group was if there had been a woman there to keep a lid on things. Mm -hmm. And um, the, these guys were great. They became... Um, I was always in at 9 or 10 o'clock at night, and I, I would hear them come in at all hours of the day or night, and the guys grouped together with guys, you know, and, and I could have gone. I, that was not my, my choosing. When we had friends over to our place, which we did very, very, very regularly, um, probably many, many more nights than we didn't have them, um, we would all be friendly and gather, and, and that was fine. And then I could just go to, to my room and read or get ready for the next day, around 9 or 10 o'clock at night. That was, was never a problem. I think the one of the th moments, stories that I really treasure when I really knew I was part of the boys was we did go out one evening to a bar where um, the guys frequented. And if I did go out with them, we always went to this particular bar. And we were sitting there, a group of six. And I remember having a Diet Coke, and they were having beer. And uh, suddenly, the guys got up, uh, they said they wanted to go trolling. So we, we'd go to this bar and 
I thought trolling was a fishing term. My husband and I fish. I thought trolling was a fishing term. So the guys got up to go pick up women to dance. And I'm going, I'm here. I'm here. None, none of my housemates even yes. asked me to dance. And I thought, yeah, I laughed and I thought, you know, you're one of the guys. You're one of the guys. They don't even see you, you know, as somebody that if they want to go out and dance, that they ought to ask to dance. And so I took that as a real compliment. Um, and that's kind of the way it was. So I think I, I was one of the guys. Uh, and at that point, for those last three years of my career, I didn't have to, I didn't have to prove that I could either be one of the guys, nor did I have to um, be a woman to flirt to get along you know, to move into that culture so much. We, we bridged that together. And I think that was a real tribute to me and a real tribute to the men I worked with, to the other you know, 97, 96, 92, whatever it is, the math men that were in that legislature that uh, I did, um, did, come, did somehow cross that gender barrier in ways that were good so that I could work as a colleague um, without some of the limitations that had been there. Any other memorable moments? So. There's one that I would say for women who want to aspire to office. And I drove up, drove up my driver. I had a driver who drove me into Tahlequah, Oklahoma, about 10 o'clock one night. We'd never stayed at this person's house either. And I was tired. And I came around the corner, and it looked like Christmas. The house had lights on it. It had Boyd signs all over it. And this African-American woman in her 60s came running out the door with a hat on that had Laura Boyd, and she had Boyd all over her, and welcomed me into the house. And we walked up the very modest steps, and she was there with her husband, and she showed me the house, and she had two grandchildren who were living with her for the summer from North Carolina. And we went into this little tiny living room, and the dining room was connected behind that, and then there was a little kitchen and went into a large room in the back that had been added on, which was the master bedroom. And uh, the grandpa was gonna sleep in this great big area in, in king size bed with the two kids that night. When you first came in the door, if you turned immediately to the right, there was a, a front room that was a couch that had been pulled out, which was the guest room of honor where I was going to sleep. And I knew that because it had a little tiny TV in there and the plastic was still on the the uh, pad, the sleeping pad. And there was a connecting bedroom, and then there were two bunks in this other room where my driver was going to sleep. To this day, I don't know where the woman of the house slept that night because I had the room of honor. And I had gotten into my room and was getting ready to get ready for bed, and she knocked on the door and said, Laura, I have something for you. And she gave me an envelope, and I said, thank you very much. And she went away. And I opened that envelope and there was a check for $1,000. And I lay in that bed, and this was early in my campaign, and I said, uh, with that $1,000, and listen to the rattling on the, yeah, you know, the plastic, and I said, God, you don't ever let me get discouraged in this campaign. Don't ever let me forget this moment, because if someone of these modest means believes in me this much, I, I have nothing to fear. I don't have a right to ever get frustrated or to ever get discouraged. Just let me remember this moment. Let me listen, feel this crackling and listen to this noise and remember this moment. And I've told that story to other candidates and other times, but that also set the standard for me for that 100,000 miles and for that campaign for governor. And I tell that story to women candidates because they need to hear it and they need to know it. that. You want to win that election. You want to have, you want that 50 plus 1% of the vote. But if you don't get that, you still win that election. There are ways to still win. Mm -hmm. And they need to know that. Yeah, very good. When you think about your time in office, are there any other memorable events work related at once you're in office? That, that are, I never that walked into that chamber that I didn't feel blessed to be there. It's overwhelming. It's beautiful. You're aware that you are sent there by people to do their work. And uh, there's so many privileges that come to you in elected office, things you get to do that others don't get to do. I was um, in office when we had the bombing in Oklahoma City. Uh, President 
Clinton came twice. I got to do many things that are very, very important to me today, special. It is a privilege to serve. You can't, you, you can never take it for granted. You should never take it for granted. Some do. You should never take it for granted that you're there to do the people's work and that you are blessed to have the special, you know, privileges and honors that you get to have. Last question. When history is written about you, what would you like for it to say? I would like it to acknowledge me as someone who made a difference for women uh, in the way she lived her life, as well as in the things she fought for, who believed in women and believed in children, who made the world a better place, and um, who, who truly was a leader. I, I would like to have led with grace and with intelligence and um, um, and just have that be a legacy. I'd like the women I've mentored to know how much I love them and that they've meant at least as much to me in my life as I think they let me know I mean to them. Thank you very much. I hope your voice here today will be heard many, many years to come. Thank you. Even John. with the Loudmouth Award, <laughs> yeah. this, this, will, this will be even better than that, I would think. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming.